Hey guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. Now, as you can see, I'm in the nature trail today. Now, there have been some very serious reports of bear sightings in the woods, so. My buddy Jeff dressed up like a bear and we're gonna scare some hikers. Hey mom, I'm a bear. Arr. Put some cameras all in the trees. We're gonna scare some hikers. Jeff, are you ready? Yeah, man, I'm ready. He's ready. Let's go. <laughs> it's gonna work. Woo! We got this YouTube viral video. Get it, Jeff. Get it, Jeff. Get it, Jeff. Yeah. 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 All right, go. Go ahead. All right, so we are in part three of this series called Scared to Death. <clears throat> and um, as much as I've enjoyed this, some of you, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I, when I was a, a, a young man, you know, I, I enjoyed being scared a little bit. My brother and I, especially at this time of year on Halloween, we found all the haunted houses to go to, and we would just hit one after the other. We'd go see scary movies. But then I became a, a, a dad, and for some reason, that feeling, that emotion, didn't become something I really enjoyed. Uh, I think when you have kids, you don't need anything else to be scared about. You're just, you live in perpetual fear uh, when, when you become a parent. So being scared wasn't something I wanted to do anymore. I, I lived in that fear. Uh, but some of you, you enjoy that. You enjoy being scared. You, you know, you go and you pay for someone to scare you. You go to the M. Night Shyamalan movies, or, or maybe you've seen that new series on Netflix called uh, The Haunting on ha uh, Hill House that I read this week. is so scary that it actually induces vomiting and people passing out. And no joke. They actually have a term for it now. It's called terror vomiting. That's how scary this is. It actually causes people to vomit. And now some of you, you're actually sick enough to think, man, I can't wait to go home and watch that. Like being scared and being so scared that you vomit sounds fun to you. Uh, it's not to me. Be being that scared isn't appealing. Really being fearful I I isn't appealing. In week one, we gave you the definition of fear. And, and fear is this, is an emotion caused by the belief of looming potential loss. Fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by a belief that, that <clears throat> something bad is going to happen, that there's something critical in the future, there's some kind of loss, there's some kind of, uh, of pain or tragedy in the future that we're about to experience, and it gives us this unpleasant emotion. So we kind of wrestled in week one uh, about the, the fear of, of our future, that, that that's exactly what fear is. We're fearing something that's ahead of us that maybe we can't see, maybe we don't understand, but there's some kind of potential loss that causes this unpleasant emotion of fear. And the last week, we talked about anxiety. And, and I, I found this conversation really, really incredible, that, that everybody, to some degree, has some kind of anxiety, have some kind of anxiousness, that we kind of live with this perpetual kind of a, a emotion of, of uh, and even this fear of like, oh, no, what if? Right? That's what anxiety is. It's all the what ifs. What if this happens? What if, what if that happens? What if, what, what if so-and-so does this? And there's this kind of perpetual anxiety that we all kind of live in. And as we uh, walked through our conversation last week, we uh, further defined anxiety. Really, we kind of carry anxiety around with us. All of us do to some degree. Uh, we carry anxiety around kind of like a software virus, right? That it just kind of hums in the background. We, we just carry it around, and it kind of lingers in the background, and it runs quietly. But, but it, the interesting thing about software viruses, much like anxiety, is it kind of slows us down, doesn't it? That, that it continues to run in the background, and it suddenly slows us down and quietly keeps us from operating at our full speed. That's what anxiety does. It kind of get, gets a grip on us, and it slows us down, and, and we never really accomplish what we want to accomplish. We never really uh, um, become everything we thought we could become. We never reach the fullness that maybe we could reach because we have this anxiety. We have th this fear, the, the what ifs. Well, what if that happens? And what if that happens? And, and we gradually take steps back and back and back. And my hope for you this morning as we kind of work through these past two messages is that you'll continue to discuss them, that you'll wrestle them through, maybe with your small group. If you're not in a small group, sign up to be in a small group. We'll get you plugged in. But that's like the best place to wrestle through this. What are our fears? What is the thing that makes me anxious? Why am I always scared of all the what ifs and how do I move past? Because the truth for all of you is that we want something better for you. Maybe you've heard that God wants something from you. We believe God wants something for you. God wants a full life. He wants a good life. We have this saying that we say all the time that following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. That there is a fullness of life that you can live in Jesus, but you're not going to live it if you're anxious. You're not going to live it if you're so fearful that it slows you down and it keeps you from operating at your fullness, at full potential. So we want you to take a step beyond fear. We want you to take a step out of fear. Week one, we talked about the fear of the future. Week two, we talked about this present kind of perpetual fear of all the what ifs. This week, we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at the fear of your past. The fear of your past. 
What I find really interesting is that I've talked with people as we've kind of wrestled through this idea of fear is that fear, if we're not careful, it kind of begins in our past, but we never address it. We never see it. We never even turn an eye to it because we don't even know it's there. But really, there is this fear that kind of, if we're not careful, can control us and keep us from being who we want to be, from accomplishing what we want to accomplish, and living in that fullness of life that God has for us. Our fears for the future are fueled by our experiences from the past. Right? We know that. Our fears from the future are fueled by our experiences from the past. That's why you, you may act a certain way and somebody's like why, like, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? Why are you not doing that? And, and our reaction is, well, because I've experienced it once before and I don't like it and I don't want to experience it again. It was very unpleasant. It hurt. It was painful. I felt like my trust was broken. I felt betrayed and I don't want to do it again. I don't want to experience that again. That's how we parent sometimes, right? Our, our, our kids, we tell them, don't touch the stove. Well, why not? Because I touch the stove, and it's hot, and it hurts. Don't touch the stove, right? Don't play with fire. Why? Because you could burn the house down. Now, I've never burned a house down, but I can imagine a child burning a house down. Don't do it, right? That's how we kind of learn from our fears. And it keeps us from becoming all that we want. Our fears for the future are fueled, fueled rather, by our experiences from the past. So what do we do? What do we do with our past? What do we do when the past controls us and keeps us from reaching the fullness or our full potential that God would have for us? I wanted to uh, start off by telling you a little story about my past, and I thought, you know what, maybe I have like this, this lighthearted kind of fun story, and then I realized I'm not the funny one, so you're going to have to deal with a serious kind of looming gray dark story. Um, you might laugh through, but, but here's what I thought. Why, why not tell you about my experiences? Because doing all of this, reading, kind of researching, preparing for this, it caused me to take a look at my own life and, and at my own fear. Now, you you might not know much about me because on Sunday mornings, you know, I get to put on a show and and this is just what you see for an hour. But but getting to this point was difficult. Uh, um, Speaking publicly was an incredible fear of mine as a child. And I know that sounds weird. Like, why did you want to be a pastor? I blame it on God. But I hated speaking publicly. And I don't know if you know, speaking publicly is actually like the number one fear in people that people would rather die than to have to speak publicly. Jerry, si- Jerry Seinfeld actually has a joke that says, you, can, like, you would rather be in the casket at a funeral than have to lead the funeral. That's how our fear works. We're scared to speak publicly, and I, I was as well. The first time I ever preached a message, I, was in, uh, I wasn't a youth pastor. I was in youth. My youth pe- pastor asked me to speak. It was seven minutes long. And I know what some of you are thinking. Like, couldn't you try that again? That sounds really good. <clears throat> seven minutes long. It was so short that my friend who showed up late asked me to pre- speak it again, and I spoke again. And I just kind of live with that, like, uncomfortable. It's like, this isn't what I want to do. I'm not good, but clearly God wants me to do this, and I'll step out. And I continued to step out, and I continued to fail, and I continued to make a step, mistakes. Fast forward a few years to where I, I became a, uh, kind of my, my first pastoral role at a church in Brewer. Um, I was preaching there for a while, and there was this woman who was at, at one of the services who just grumbled every time I taught. You could see, like, like, like the, the unsatisfied look on her face. You would hear grumblings afterwards. And one particular afternoon... Uh, I just felt like, well, you know, I'm just going to deal with it. I'm, I'm going to confront this issue. So I called and said, is there a problem? And she had the kindest words to say. No, she ripped me down like I've never felt ripped down in my entire life. And that moment created such a, like a, a moment of fear for me to move forward and to speak and, and to try and pass her after that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And there are still times in my life when I go back to the words that she shared about how you should never speak. You don't have a gift for it. You're not called. Like you should do anything else besides getting up to speak. It, it created this moment of fear in me like I've never felt before. Where every time I got up, every time I'd sit in those seats before I got up to speak, it would like be overwhelming. And I had to confront, I had to deal with it. And it was uncomfortable. And I remember oftentimes thinking to myself, I never, ever in my life want to experience that kind of feeling again. I never want to experience that kind of disappointment. I never want to experience that kind of shame and embarrassment. I don't ever want to experience that again. And that one comment like set back my career. It, it, it caused me to, to feel very timid. It caused me to not be the person that God wanted me to be. That moment where fear came into my life, that moment in my past, it kept me from reaching the future that God had for me until I was willing to look at it. And it was difficult and it was uncomfortable. But I can remember 
what it made me feel like. And I can remember the feelings I've had. And I'm sure if you were to take a look back in your life and think, what is that moment? What is that thing? What, what, is, that, what is that thing that kind of binds me and makes me scared that I can look back on? You never want to feel that way again. I don't want to relive those memories. I don't want to, I don't even want to, some of us don't even, even want to talk about it because it's so uncomfortable. But for us, as we kind of continue this conversation today, what we're going to learn and discover is if we never go back to the fear, we'll never reach the future that God has. You see, our past is a problem when it creates fear for our future. The past really becomes a problem when it creates fear for our future, when it keeps us from living and from becoming all that we could be and doing all that we were supposed to do. It kind of builds a wall, and it keeps us on the inside, and it keeps everybody else on the outside. So I designed this wall for you, and we're going to look at a few things that I, I think people use to kind of keep people out. Now, we never intend to, to like, build a wall between people. It's not like, say, I'm going to build a wall of all my insecurities and all my fear, and I'm going to stay on this side and you stay on that side. But what often happens is we use these things, and because of these things, we've kind of built a wall to keep ourselves in and keep other people out. And the first one is control. Right? We, we have this, this desire to control things, and, and I'm going to control a situation, and because of it, I'm going to keep me over here because I can control this, and I can't control you, so you stay out there. Control is a huge thing that people use to begin building a wall, to begin keeping us maybe kind of cornered and blocked in, where we may say, hey, I feel safe here, but we're never living the life we want to live. We're never seeing the fullness of life that God might have for us. Control is the first one. The second one is withdrawal. Right? We tend to withdraw. We tend to pull back. We tend to not want to take a step out and maybe meet people or talk to people. I'm going to withdraw because it's safer on this side of the wall. How about this one? This is one that I think a lot of guys deal with, a lot of guys struggle with. And not just men. I think some women do it as well. But I know from my conversations, it's a lot in men. And that's anger. I may not be angry at you. I may not be angry at the situation. I'm just angry. I'm angry because of something that happened in my past that I might not even realize, and it makes me uncomfortable, and it makes me upset, and I'm going to take it out on you, or I'm going to take it out on my friends, or my family, or the people around me. Anger is a huge issue. How about this one? This is kind of the opposite, but humor. Right? You've met the funny people. They make you laugh, and humor can be a good thing, but humor is not a good thing when it keeps us in a wall and keeps other people away, but we never have to open up. We never have to kind of be vulnerable and have relationships with people. Or how about this, along the same lines, uh, sarcasm, right? Sarcasm can be funny, but sarcasm isn't funny when it builds a wall and it keeps you out from my life. How about this, critical? You've met those people. Those are the people that, that you know, you can never make happy. No matter how good you are, it's never good enough. No matter how happy you are, you're never happy enough. No matter how pretty it is, it's never pretty enough. They always have that negative comment. They're just the critical people. And then we've all met somebody. We all maybe even have someone in our lives who've used this to build a wall and keep us out, and that's substance abuse. Where I'm, I'm just going to build my wall, and I want to isolate myself and keep me here, and you just stay out there. You see, what do we do when our past creates so much fear that it keeps us from becoming who we want to be, that it keeps us from reaching the future and the goals and the desires that we have for us? You see, we've all struggled with this. We've all dealt with fear on some level. And really, we all have something in our past that we can point to that we use in the present to build a wall. We're going to look at, at a really interesting story. Uh, it's, it's a story from a, a man in Scripture that I don't think a lot of people know about. Um, it, it, the story is wrapped up in one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's, I think, the third shortest book with only like 330 words. And I, I know that you're thinking, like, is this, a, is this Bible trivia? Why do I need to know this? None of that's going to change your life. But here's what I find really, really significant, is that this incredible story comes from one of the smallest books with one chapter. That whole letter, this whole book, was written so that we get this one point about this one man. His name is Onesimus. Onesimus is a man in the New Testament. He was a slave of a man named Philemon. Philemon was a, a wealthy Christian who was friends with Paul. And uh, Onesimus, as a slave, what we know about him is that he was on the run, and that most likely he stole from his wealthy owner, Philemon. And because he stole, he lived in fear and ran away from his life and began hiding. He ends up encountering Paul. Paul meets him, introduces him to Jesus. They start kind of doing life together, living, uh, you know, preaching, like as friends do. 
And then Paul writes this letter to Philemon, and he basically is writing a letter to say, hey, I want to send this guy back to you. I want to send Onesimus back to you because there's something in his past that will keep him from ever meeting his future, that will keep him from ever accomplishing what's in front of him in his future. There's something in his past that he has to deal with, that he has to get right so that he can move on. And around 61 to 63 AD, Paul writes this letter to Philemon, basically saying, hey, I'm sending this man back to you. I'm sending your slave back to you. I'm sending the man who robbed from you and who took from you back to you. And and as I'm telling this story, I want you to imagine what it was like in this culture. Like, you stole from someone. It's not like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, you move on. They could cut your hands off. They could imprison you. They could kill you. You were a slave. So Onesimus is fearing his life, and he runs away and hides. And this one moment in his past completely derailed his future until Paul says, you've got to go back and deal with it. To move forward in the future, you've got to deal with your past. And here's how Paul tells the story. He says this in verse 9, It is none other than I, Paul, an old man, And now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. He's basically saying, hey, hey, this guy, this man, Onesimus, this slave that I know, he's not really my son, but he has become like a son. We met each other while I was in prison. We formed a relationship. I introduced him to Jesus. And now this man who was a slave, he's now something different. He's like, he's not the slave anymore. He's now like a son to me. He's like a brother. I care for him, that something has changed with this man Onesimus, and it is deeply important, Philemon, that you understand this. Formerly, Paul says, and I I almost hate and love and hate how Paul says this. He says, formerly, Onesimus was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. Now, we don't know this for sure, but you can kind of of infer this, that, that perhaps it was Philemon that told Onesimus, you are useless, You have no value. You are worth nothing to me. Paul's saying, yeah, he was that way. But there's something different. He's changed. Something different about him. And now he is useful to you. And he is useful to me. Has anyone in your life ever told you that you are useless? That you're worthless? Can you identify with Onesimus at all? That that, that somebody just has has no good intentions, has no good thoughts. They just think you're just a waste of space. Maybe you're an accident. You should have never been born. You should never be here. You're just, you're useless. What would Paul have to say to you to convince you to deal with your past? As he's saying to Onesimus, you were useless, but no more. Something in you has changed. You're not the same man you were before. Something's different about you. He says, I'm sending him back. Who is my very heart? Back to you. I'm sending back this man that I've grown to love, this man who's like a child. He's like, he's like it's closer than, than, than just like a slave and a master relationship. He is like a brother to me, and I'm sending him back to you, Philemon. I want him to confront his past. I want him to confront you. I want him to move on. But to move on, he's got to deal with this first. And then Paul tells him, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while, was that you might have him back forever. Perhaps the reason that Onesimus had to run away, perhaps the reason that Onesimus maybe even stole from you and came to me is so that you could have him back forever. Now, I'm not saying that God made this happen. I'm not saying that God forced Onesimus to steal and encounter this horrible thing in his life so that he could come back. But I am saying that perhaps God's using some awful decision, some terrible thing that happened to bring some good out of it. You see, I don't think God is the author of our pain. I don't think he's the author of our sicknesses. I don't think God caused something awful to happen to you in your life or in your childhood, something that you kind of look back on with disdain and regret, something that should have never happened to you. God didn't cause that. But God can take that and maybe bring some good out of it. God didn't make Onesimus steal from Philemon. But God decided to take this awful situation and use it for good, that maybe it was so that Onesimus could come back and you could have him forever. Maybe it's not just a coincidence. You see, Onesimus, I'm sending him back to you, Philemon, but no longer as a slave, he says. No, no, it's better than a slave. It's as a dear brother. 
No longer is he coming back the same man he was when he went away. No longer, he's no longer coming back to you as like a thief and a slave, as someone who deserves that kind of punishment. I'm sending him back to you, and there is something different. There is something significant that has changed in his life. He is not the same he was before. He's not the slave. He's not the person who's, who has that kind of debt or the thief. Something is different about him, and I'm sending him back to you because of what is different in him. Because there's something different, I'm sending him back. And he is no longer coming back to you as a slave. I mean, imagine being Onesimus and having Paul convince you. You need to go back. You need to deal with this. You need to confront your past. Yeah, but he can take my life. Yeah, I'm not saying it's going to work out. I'm not saying when you confront Philemon that that it's going to be all like sunshine and rainbows. It might not turn out the way you want it to turn out. But, but here's what I know, uh, Onesimus. You can go back and you can deal with this and you can live, like you can re-enter this situation with the same set of circumstances and get a very different outcome because of who you are. Because you are no longer a slave. Because there is something new in you. You don't have to go back and deal with it the same way. The outcome may not even be the outcome you want. But here's what I know. If you go back and you confront your fear, if you go back and you confront your past, you can move on from it. And you can begin to live in freedom. You can begin to live in joy. You can begin to live in peace. Even if it doesn't go your way. Because you've dealt with your past, you can move on from it and begin to get the future that God always had for you. What would Paul have to do to convince you? What would Paul have to say to you to convince you to go back and confront your past? What letter would he have to write? Paul goes on, he says, So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And then listen to these words. If he has done any wrong, or if he owes you anything, charge it to me. Charge it to me. Have you ever had anybody like pay for you that way? Like there was a debt you couldn't pay? And they're like, here, t- you know, t- take my credit card, charge it to me. Or if you're following the, the principles of financial peace, it's like, take my debit card and put, put you know, <clears throat> give me the tab. Have you ever had anybody be willing to just pay the debt for you? You see, these words are so incredible. What Paul's saying here is because this is what we believe about the gospel. And if you haven't heard that word gospel before, it just means good news. Or in our case, we believe it's like the best news. That there was a debt that you couldn't pay, and Jesus decided to pay it for you. That maybe there was a debt that was even owed you. That somebody did something to you. Somebody did something when you were a child or a teenager. They ruined your life. They affected your life. They owe you an incredible debt. And they'll, they'll never be able to pay it. They'll never be able to pay it back. They'll never be able to make it right. But Jesus said, charge it to me. I'll make it right. I'll pay their debt. It should have never happened to you. No one should have to owe you that. No one should have ever done that to you, and they'll never be able to pay it back. Charge it to me. You see, we kind of understand why Paul writes this because of Paul's life. You may know a lot about Paul's life. You know, may know very little about Paul's life. But before this, before Paul became a follower of Jesus, he was an awful man who traveled around persecuting Christians, putting them in prison, separating families, watching them die. The first martyr that's recorded in the Bible, a man named Stephen, Paul was there and orchestrated his stoning. He stoned him to death. And these are men, these are women that had families, that had children. So you can imagine as Paul became a follower of Jesus, going back into his past, right, confronting his past, going back to those places and saying, I'm sorry, just doesn't cut it. I am so sorry for what I've done. If I could do anything, please let me know. And you can imagine as a family, Can you bring him back? Because if you can't bring him back, there's nothing you can do. Nothing's going to make it right. You see, Paul experienced the fullness of God's grace, the fullness of the gospel, where Jesus was to say, Paul owes you a debt, but he will never be able to pay it. Charge it to me. Maybe it's somebody in your past, like a family member who took advantage of you. Maybe it's something you suffered. Maybe it was a horrible decision where trust was broken. And Jesus is saying, they will never be able to pay it back. Charge it to me. It was never supposed to be. Nobody can ever make it right. But I promise you, I'll try to find a way to bring good out of it. Charge it to me. I mean, these words are so incredibly powerful for Onesimus and for Philemon to be in that relationship, to understand 
no matter what his debt is, no matter what he owes you, no matter what he took from you, if he owes you anything, you charge it against me and I'll take care of it. Because Onesimus can't pay it back. Onesimus can't make it right. But I can. See, this is the heartbeat about what we believe as a church. This is why we created a church to do this and to model this. That it's not, a, a, it's not contingent, us getting right, us, us kind of making ourselves right will never happen. But that Jesus came and made us right. That Jesus came and fixed our bad decisions. That the debt that we owe to other people, Jesus said, you'll never be able to pay it, but I'll pay it for you. This is what we believe. If he owes you anything, charge it to me, Paul says. Charge it to me. Maybe it was those words that gave Onesimus the courage to go back. Maybe it was Paul saying that, like, finally, Onesimus believed that this can be made right. This can be resolved because somebody's willing to pay for me. I can't do it myself, but somebody will do it for me. You know, we don't know how, how the story concludes because this was a letter Paul wrote to Philemon. But what we do know is Paul sent this letter with Onesimus and a few men to go and find Philemon and present this letter. And you can imagine this kind of confrontational moment. Philemon as a wealthy landowner being disgraced, being almost embarrassed and ashamed because of this, this slave who stole from him is now in front of him with a group of men. And the men come up and hand him a letter. Hey, Philemon, I have a letter for you from Paul. You remember Paul, that guy you love, you know, that Christian guy who's like started all these churches we're kind of indebted to? Yeah, yeah, I remember him. He has a letter for you. He wrote it to you. Why don't you read it? And Philemon in front of all these men, in front of Onesimus, who's standing there, you can imagine the shame. You can imagine the feelings that he's feeling. Begins to read this letter. Gets the whole way to the bottom and hears those words. If he owes you anything, charge it to me. Accept him back because he is not the same man he was when he went away. What would it take for you to go back and confront your past? What would Paul have to say to you to encourage you? No matter what the outcome is, it is worth it to go back and confront your past because you will never move forward unless you deal with what's behind. Some of you, you like that story, and I hope it, it helps maybe change your heart or change your direction, change your mind on something. Others of you, you're just... You know, you're the bullet type people. I don't need a story. That was all, that was great. That was dramatic. Just give me the bullet points. What do I have to do, Jim? So here's what I want to do. I want to give you three things you have to do to move forward. If you ever plan on moving forward, if you ever plan on reaching the future that God has for you, if you ever plan on moving into the fullness of life, living life to its full, as Jesus said, here's what you have to do to move forward. The first thing is you have to identify your wall. What is your wall? What is the thing that you build that keeps people out and keeps you locked in? And if you don't know, ask somebody who's close to you. Ask your spouse. Ask your kids. Ask your parents. My guess is somebody knows, and they'll be happy to point you in the right direction. But if you're that person who's being asked, you know, someone comes up to you and says, you know, I'm trying to figure out what my issue is. Why do I keep people out? What keeps me blocked in? And I think my, my issue might be anger. What do you think of that? Don't be the guy or the girl who's like, yeah, I am so glad you finally discovered that. I've been waiting for you to get here. I've been like, this is good. Yeah, that is clearly your issue. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to act a little more like Taylor Swift at the Grammys. Right? Every year she wins something. Every year she knows she's going to win something. And every year when the camera rolls over to her, she jumps up like, who, me? That's how I want you to be. Hey, I, I think I might have an issue with anger. Who, you? No. I mean, I, I, well, I guess if I think about it, maybe... Like, yeah, I mean, I guess. I guess the more you're saying, yeah, I guess I can see how that's true. I mean, you know, don't look in any of my journals where I've been writing for years about your anger issue and hoping you discover it. Like, let's move. yeah, I guess I can see that anger might be your issue. You've got to identify your wall. And if you can't do it on your own, ask somebody to help. What is the thing I use to keep people out and keep me walled in? For me, it's the first three I gave you. I felt like it was most important to talk to me first. Control, withdrawal, and anger. Those are the things I use to keep me blocked in and keep everyone else blocked out. When fear controls me, when my past gets the better of me, that's what I tend to go for. Identify your wall. And once you identify your wall, you have to address it. You have to address the past. You have to be willing to look into that situation. You have to be willing to look in, in, into the, you know, th that experience in your home or into that relationship where it fell apart or into that deal where the, the trust was broken. You have to be willing to address it. Get face-to-face -face with it, and it's going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to like it, but you will never move forward. You'll never get to the future you want until you confront the past that you regret. 
address it. Look at it face to face. And it may be uncomfortable and it may be ugly. It may bring up all kinds of emotions you don't want to experience. But if you ever want to get to where you think God has you, you've got to deal with what's behind you. And once you identify your wall and once you address it, then you've got to settle it. Then you've got to go and have a conversation with someone that you don't want to talk to. You've got to go and you've got to ask for forgiveness. And that's not easy. Or, or, or maybe you need to forgive without even someone asking you to forgive them. And that might be the hardest thing in the world to do, isn't it? Where somebody wronged you and they owe you so much and they will never ask you for forgiveness. But if you ever plan on moving on in your life, you've got to be able to forgive even without them repenting. Some of you are going to have to do the hardest thing in the world and that's to forgive people that have wronged you that don't even feel shame about it, that don't feel guilty about it. But if you want to move on with your life, if you want to reach the fullness of life that Jesus would have for you, you've got to identify your wall, address the past, <clears throat> and settle it. Don't let fear caused by the past experience keep you from experiencing God in your future. Don't let the fear that was in your past, whatever that event was, whatever caused you to fear, don't allow that to keep you from experiencing what God wants in your future. Because we believe God is our Heavenly Father, God who invited us to call him Father has something incredible in store for you. Has a life full of peace, a life full of joy, a life free from, from that kind of pain and chaos and torment when you're constantly on the run. Life in its fullness. But you'll never get there if fear controls you. You'll never get there if the fear from your past is keeping you from reaching your future. Onesimus had something to fear, but it didn't stop him. You might have something to fear. Let me encourage you, don't let it stop you. Identify it, address it, and settle it. You can move past your past, but what you find in Jesus is greater than what you fear. And I believe that for all of you. I believe that you're, what you find in Jesus is greater than any pain than any experience, than anything that's been done to you, than anything that you've done to other people, what you find in Jesus is greater than that, is greater than the very thing you fear. For some of you today, it's going to be like starting a, something new with Jesus. Maybe it's starting that relationship for the first time that you've never, you, you've never really had a relationship with Jesus. But this morning as we're talking, you realize for the very first time, I, I can't do it on my own. Like I've tried to control this. I can see my wall. I can see that I blocked myself in and kept people out. And, and no matter how hard I try, I can't overcome. I can't get past this. You, we say that all the time. I just can't get past this. Maybe today for the very first time you would say, God, I, I'm just, I transfer my trust from me to you. Jesus, I trust you. Will you forgive me? And will you help me forgive the people or the person that has done something wrong to me? Maybe this morning that's you. Maybe this morning is the start of a new relationship for you. Maybe you've been following Jesus for years. And you've just kind of kept this thing tucked away in the corner so no one sees it. And you think you're doing a really good job. My guess is the people that are closest to you know exactly where that wall is and know exactly what that wall is made of. You're not fooling anyone. Don't turn a blind eye and think you have it in control. Identify the wall. Address it and settle it. This morning we're going to close with a song if the worship team would come up. It's a song that we're all familiar with. It's a song that we've sung many times. But the point of this song is essentially this. You are no longer a slave when you realize that you're a child of God. It's not that the circumstances have even changed. It's that you are now a different person. It's that same thing Paul was talking about with Onesimus. I'm sending him back to you, Philemon, not as the same person. There is something different in him because he's no longer a slave. He's a child of God. And when you realize you're a child of God, you realize that fear no longer can control you. You are no longer a slave to fear because you are a child of God. If you stand to your feet this morning and sing with us. Those words are so powerful. I remember teaching them to my daughter when she was scared one night, just over and over again. The next time you feel scared, you just remind yourself, you are no longer a slave to your fear. There's something different about you. You're now a child of God. 
and you just remind yourself and you encourage yourself. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those words. God, I thank you for this incredible story that if, God, if we're in a rush, we miss it. God, you can look right past that chapter, that book that is so incredible. God, that there was a man who realized he can confront his past. There was a real man who realized there is a better future in store for him. And he can confront it and he can address it and he can move on. Not because of who he is, God, but because of what you've done for him. Because you made him a child of God. I pray for all of us here, God, as we kind of confront our fear, as we identify that wall, as we address the past, God, that you would give us the wisdom to know what to do, God, and give us the courage to do it. And I pray that we would move past and we would begin to step into that fullness of life that you have for us, a life of peace and a life of joy, not a life on the run, not a life that's bound by fear and held captive, God, but a life that's free in Jesus' name, amen.